Well, good morning. Open your Bibles to the first psalm, the first psalm. If you don't have a traditional Bible and you'd like to have one and you're comfortable, just raise your hand and one of my friends will bring you one. You can either borrow that or you can keep it. It's our gift to you. Of course, you can also take the YouVersion app or it's also called the Bible app and open that up and all the notes and scriptures. Those have already been uploaded. We'll also put all the scriptures up here on the screen behind me. If you're watching us online or at one of our other gatherings, I love you. And I'm so glad that you're a part of our family. I don't know if you know this, but we have gatherings that are happening all over the place. We've got different cities in the U.S. We've got gatherings in Hong Kong, in mainland China. We've got a gathering uh, in Israel. We have a gathering in Canada. And then, of course, we have you. And so it's so good to see you. Give yourselves a hand because you got up and took a shower today and (laughs) did your hair. Happy Resurrection Sunday, or for all of us who are normal, happy Easter. Anybody who knows me knows that I love Easter. I love all the stuff, the candy, the coloring contest, coloring the eggs, the egg hunts, the people going to church as a family, the Easter lunch where we make all the stuff, the mashed potatoes and gravy, the hot rolls, the ham, um, ham. (laughs) Thank God for pig. Isn't it interesting how so many of us have a meal that celebrates Jesus' resurrection by eating a food that he couldn't eat? I mean, anyway, I love (laughs) Easter. Did I mention I love the candy? I don't know if you could tell that by my build. I know I look like Arnold, but I love the candy and peeps and Cadbury eggs. I wish they had Cadbury eggs out all year. Of course, the star of the show, the chocolate bunny. I love that your kids are getting extra sugared up in there right now. It's awesome. You're welcome for the ride home. Uh, One of my favorite things actually about Easter is making Easter, Easter baskets for all of our staff kids. I do it every year, and quite honestly, I get a little bit out of hand with it, I actually go to Walmart and I buy all the candy. And it was uh, fascinating to watch the workers at Walmart watch me, because I did this (laughs) self-checkout. And the candy was literally, looked like, it looked like I was grocery shopping at Costco. It was like a heaping (laughs) helping of Southern hospitality. It was just like candy upon candy. And because I was at the self-checkout, I couldn't figure out how to go, hey, I have 17 chocolate bunnies. I had to boop, 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 boop. And the people behind me were like, this is incredible. And their kid was with them. I said, this is what every kid who comes to Life Church on Easter Sunday gets. This is actually for one kid. And the parents are like, shut your mouth. We're definitely going back to our own church. So I'm a dentist's dream and a parent's nightmare. So with all of that said again, happy Easter, happy Resurrection Sunday. I love you, and I'm so glad that you're here because he is alive. So I want to continue this series that we've been in today by talking in a message that we're calling Between Two Trees. Let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice, and we will be glad in it. God, thank you for my friends who are here. Thank you for everything that this whole weekend represents. God, a sacrifice that was paid, a battle that was won, death that was defeated, a tomb that was left empty, people who were activated, motivated, moved, and changed. I pray today that those things would happen in every one of us, God. I pray that when we leave this place, this won't just have been a yearly event for us. This will be a moment of change. It will be a moment of activation, that our hearts and our minds would be changed. We'd be more like you and less like us in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I love trees. They're, They're so peaceful to me, whether it's looking at them or listening to them, the sight of them swaying or the sound of a breeze rustling through their leaves, they are a picture of peace to me, whether it's a birch or a poplar, an ash or an elm, an oak tree and all of its grandeur, or the behemoth known as the redwood, which if I could be any tree, it would be a redwood because they get stronger with age. The oldest of all trees, uh, they often grow to well over 300 feet in height and over 20 feet in diameter. Some are so large that we've built highways 
through their trunk. People literally travel from all over the world just so they can see them with their very own eyes. They're naturally resistant to insects, fungi, and fire because they're high in tannin and they don't produce resin or pitch. They can withstand winds of over 90 miles per hour because although shallow, their root system grows over 12 feet out in every direction and intertwines with the root system of the other redwoods around them, literally holding each other up and sharing each other's nutrients. Only redwoods have the strength and the ability to support other redwoods. If you plant a redwood next to an oak and they grow up together, one of those trees will die. If I could be a tree, a redwood is the kind I'd want to be. I, I have a lot of good memories that are connected to trees. I had a tree in my backyard that was my everything when I was a kid. It, it was a, a target for my BB gun. It was my original jungle gym. It, it had a branch that for years I would jump and try to reach. <laughs> and when I finally was able to snatch that branch, you couldn't tell me nothing. I would swing on that thing for hours and hours. Tarzan didn't have nothing on me. One day, though, I got tired of just swinging on that branch, and I decided to hang a tire swing from it. I spent the entire day getting it set up, and finally, just as the sun was setting, it was ready. I got in that tire, I pushed off with my feet, and the minute that I pushed off with my feet, that branch, it immediately snapped. It couldn't take my weight and the weight of the tire. You need to be careful of the things in your life that you're adding weight to. And with that branch broken, I just decided the next natural progression is that I wanted to build a treehouse. And y'all, it was the most bootleg treehouse of all time. This is what it looked like in my mind. <laughs> but this is what it really looked like. <laughs> trees. I love trees. I, I always wanted to have one of those little karate kid trees that you trim with little tiny mustache scissors. We, we actually just had a row of trees cut back so that we could have a fence built in our backyard. And I wish we would have just left them alone because we lost the aesthetic, we lost the shade, and we lost our privacy. Trees, they're important. They serve a significant purpose. In fact, according to the National Wildlife Federation, here are 10 proven ways that trees make a big difference. Number one, they improve air quality. They're called the lungs of the earth because they absorb pollutants through their leaves, trap those pollutants, then filter the contaminants before releasing oxygen into the air through photosynthesis. Number two, they improve water quality and they reduce flooding and erosion. Their leafy canopy, it catches precipitation before it reaches the ground, allowing some of it to gently drip while the rest of it evaporates. Their roots, they hold soil in place, reducing erosion, lessening the forces of storms and the amount of runoff into sewers, streams, and rivers, improving water quality. Did you know that a mature tree can intercept about a thousand gallons of rainfall per year? Number three, they temper the climate. They lower air temperatures and humidity and influence wind speed, evaporation of water from them. It has a cooling effect. Uh, planting trees strategically around a parking lot, it reduces the surface temperature of the asphalt by 36 degrees and the interior of the cars parked there by 47 degrees. Number four, they conserve energy. Planting trees strategically on the sunny side of a home shades it from the hot summer sun, reducing air conditioning costs by 30%. Then, then when they lose their leaves in the winter, it exposes the house to the warming winter sun, lowering the energy needed to heat the house. Number five, they're good for the economy. Economists have found that the value of properties with trees are 9 to 15% higher than properties without. Number six, they create a habitat for plants and for animals, wherever trees are established, wildlife and other plants, they're sure to follow. That ensures a healthier ecosystem. Number seven, they improve health. <laughs> Research demonstrates that exposure to trees reduces stress. Hospital patients with the window view of trees recover 20% faster than those without. Interestingly, kids with ADD, it's been proven that they're able to concentrate more consistently when they're regularly exposed to trees. 
Number eight, trees reduce crime. Bet you didn't know that, did you? Data shows that apartment buildings with a high concentration of trees have significantly fewer crimes than those without. Number nine, they reduce noise pollution. A a belt of trees reduces highway noise by up to 10 decibels, reducing the sound volume by more than half. Finally, number 10, they promote community. Hmm. When determining where to invest, land developers look for neighborhoods with active tree planting programs. It projects a pride of ownership and proves as an impetus for other potential community renewal. Trees. They are important. They serve a significant purpose. I want to talk about two of them today. I want to talk to you about the tree in the creation story and the tree in the crucifixion story. First, the tree in the creation story. If you've been in church for very long, you've heard the story of the temptation and the fall of man. God had given man access to everything in his creation except for one thing, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which of course was the very thing that Satan used as a source of temptation and as a way to cast doubt and to create fear in the minds of Eve and Adam. God told Adam, he said, he said, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you mustn't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So the enemy comes along and he twists the word. He defies the word of God by saying, you certainly will not die. For God knows on the day that you eat from it, your eyes, they will be opened and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. And, and that tree, it becomes the entry point for sin, the foundation for the fall. And the fall was actually a result of a four-stage process. It began with doubt, which led to denial, then to disbelief, which then culminated in disobedience. You know, a fall is seldom sudden. Some of you are in the midst of a fall right now. Some of you are in the middle of a fall. Some of you are halfway there. Some of you are on the precipice of a fall. You've already been having conversations. You've already been entertaining thoughts. Some of you are at the very beginning of a fall. You're at the beginning of a journey. I preached this weekend in Toronto, Canada. I flew into Detroit. I crossed the border because it's easier to cross the border by land than it is by air. And so I crossed the border from Detroit into Windsor. And I know I've taken that route many times. And so I know that although it is a four hour trip from Detroit to Toronto, I know that all along that route strategically placed are things they call on routes. An on route is a is just a glorified rest stop that has Tim Hortons in Jesus' name. <laughs> and so I know that about every 30 to 45 minutes, I'm going to have an opportunity to stop and get another 24-ounce double-double coffee. Hallelujah. <laughs> and some of you are in the midst. You're at the beginning of a fall. A fall is seldom sudden. It's almost always progressive. And so Adam and Eve, they experienced disconnection and distance. Failure almost always results in disconnection and distance. And the progression of the consequences were actually a four-stage process. Adam and Eve experienced four stages of exile. Spiritual, relational, emotional, and physical. Now, in the spiritual exile, Adam and Eve's disobedience led them to become distant and disconnected from God. And when they became distant and disconnected from God, they hid in their nakedness. They hid in their shame. Secondly, in the relational exile, Adam and Eve became distant and disconnected from each other. And while they were disconnected from each other, they they began to blame each other when they were addressed by God. When they were addressed by God, they immediately began shifting responsibility and pointing fingers. And humanity has struggled with unhealthy and dysfunctional relationships ever since. Divorce, sibling rivalry, abuse, racism, discrimination, even genocide, all of those things have their roots in the relational exile that resulted from the fall. 
Number three, the emotional exile, in that Adam and Eve became distant and disconnected from their true selves, from their God-given identities. They went from being born worshipers to being burden workers. And humanity has struggled with their identity to this day as a result of that fall. Fourthly, in the physical exile, Adam and Eve were distanced and disconnected from Eden. Its entrance and its location were hidden and sealed. And so humanity became distant and disconnected from the creation that they were supposed to rule over and steward. And as a result of that, we've been looking for our purpose and a sense of home ever since. But even though exile is a reality, it isn't a finality. In the aftermath of the fall, God addressed the serpent Satan and he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and, he, and you will strike his heel. It's, it's a promise that is fulfilled in what we're celebrating today in, in Resurrection Sunday. Like, have you ever wondered why Jesus came to earth when Jesus came to earth? Life is not coincidence. Nothing that happens is by happenstance. God never makes mistakes. God never goes, oh, ha. it wasn't just on the timeline. His, his iPhone didn't go off and he go, oh, snap. You got to send Jesus tomorrow. We better party today. You know what I'm saying? It's not like going on a diet. Incidentally, I'm, I'm going on a program tomorrow. Thank you. Thankfully to Pastor Barry, I, I woke up one day and I felt like I got stung by a bee and I needed an EpiPen, like I was having an allergic reaction to life, like I looked like the nutty professor. And then I saw Pastor Barry getting all smooth and suave and skinny, and I was like, the devil is a liar. I can't have my boy be skinnier than me. And so today, I'm going to eat as much chocolate as humanly possible. You ever wonder how many, how many pounds are gained on the day before a diet? It wasn't like God was like, oh, shoot. I almost forgot, it was strategic. Of all the thousands of years that he could have come before, and of the thousands of years he could have chosen to wait to come, why is it that Jesus chose to come when he came? Believe it or not, it is because of a tree. Because trees are important, they serve a significant purpose. In his omniscience, that means being all-knowing, in his omniscience, God waited until the very moment in time when the method of execution was crucifixion. Hmm. Now, the Romans, uh, they certainly didn't create the death penalty. They, they probably, up until that point, had perfected it. But, but the death penalty had been around for thousands of years before the Romans were in power. The Greeks, for example, they would boil you in molten metal, and then they would leave you in that metal, and the metal would harden so that you would look like Han Solo for all of time. The Babylonians, they would flay you. That means that they would skin you alive. The Persians, who are, who are perhaps the most ruthless people who have ever walked the earth. If you've ever seen the movie 300, the, the guys that come in with the jury and the elephants, the, those were Persians. And, and so the Persians, they mastered the death penalty. They, they would uh, put you in a boat, and, and they would do two things. Number one, they would bloat you with milk and honey. They would, they would make you drink as much milk and honey mixture as they could until you were literally filled to the brim. And, and then they would bathe you in milk and honey, your body. And then they would, they would put you in a boat with rodents. And the rodents would wait until the milk and honey started to come out. You feel me? And so then the rodents would then begin to devour your body from inside the boat. But what was even more ruthless is that they would, they would then take another boat and they would clamp another boat on top of the boat that they had put you in, but they would leave your arms and your legs out of the boat so that flies would be attracted to the milk and the honey on your limbs and slowly devour them. 
That's some people who thought about some stuff. You know what I'm saying? They didn't, just, they didn't just wake up one day and go, you know what we should do? Let's fill them with milk and honey, coat them in milk and honey, put them in a boat. So they must have had a contest, like the American Idol of killing people. I don't know how they came up with it, if the guy won a million dollars or a dream home. I'm not sure, but that is very creative. The Chinese, that they would just cut off one body part at a time, culminating in cutting you off at the waist. The Romans, of course, as you know, they used the method of crucifixion, where they would nail you to a tree, uh, which is why God chose this very moment in time for Jesus to come. Since a tree caused the fall, and, and because the curse of sin entered the world through the first Adam, Jesus, or as theologians call him, the second Adam, had to die on a tree to reverse the curse. And and that tree became the entry point for salvation, the foundation for the rise after the fall. Since man had stolen his innocence from a tree, God had to return innocence to the tree in the form of his sinless Savior Son. And Satan, he'd been waiting for this moment since the fall of man began. He was hell-bent on defeating the second Adam, Jesus, just as he had defeated the first Adam. So he influenced the soldiers to beat him and place a crown of thorns on his head. He, he instigated the Jewish leaders to bring charges against him, and he incited Pilate to execute him by having his hands and his feet nailed to a cross. But what Satan didn't understand was that God is in the business of turning curses into blessings. So much so that every method the enemy used to torture Jesus played right into God's plan for the rise after the fall. In his book, Mysteries of the Messiah, Rabbi jo Jason Sobel, he lists all of this in detail. He says that, that Jesus' hands were pierced because since it was hands that had stolen the promise from the tree, hands were required to return the promise to the tree. His side, it was pierced because it was Eve who was the initial entry point of sin and she was taken from man's side. His feet, they were pierced because the first messianic prophecy is that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent underneath his feet. He had a crown of thorns put on his head because the sign of the curse of sin was that the ground would produce thistles and thorns. And so Jesus literally took the curse of creation on his head to reverse the curse and restore the blessing. He was buried in a garden tomb because since it all began in a garden, it all had to end in a garden. And in the precise process of his execution, Jesus reversed the four stages of exile. He reversed the spiritual exile by returning to the tree the spiritual promise that was removed from the tree. He reversed the relational exile by absorbing and ultimately defeating rejection and betrayal. He, he reversed the emotional exile by experiencing what he felt like was his father forsaking him, but he did so for our sake. He reversed the physical exile by having his physical body laid in a tomb for three days while he took the keys from the enemy by defeating hell, death, and the grave and rising again so that we can have access to eternal life and everlasting forgiveness, all made possible because of God. God this tree because trees they are important they serve a significant purpose and I wonder today if you're living between two I wonder if you're living between the tree of creation where sin was discovered and the tree of crucifixion where sin was defeated if you are you can lay your sins at the feet of the tree of crucifixion and if you'll do that you will prosper the Bible says, blessed is the one who doesn't walk in step with the wicked, who doesn't stand in the way that sinners take, who doesn't sit in the company of mockers, but instead, whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on it day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. I wonder if you'll take all of the nonsense, all of the sin, all of the shame, all of the drama that you carried into this place, and you'll lay it at the feet of the tree of crucifixion. I hope you'll do that because this is Resurrection Sunday. And not only is he alive, you can be too. Would you close your eyes all across this place? Resurrection Sunday. He is alive. 
I remember the day that I gave my life to Jesus. It was monumental. It was the pivot point in my history and my destiny. For me, it was in a football locker room. It was because a coach had read John 3.16. For you, it's Resurrection Sunday 2022. You came because you wanted peace in your home. You came because your mama asked you to or because your auntie asked you to. You came because you wanted your wife to get off your case. But something happened today. There's somebody in here that something happened today. Something happened before a sermon was preached, before a song was sung, before a coffee cup was poured for someone you drove into this parking lot. And something captured you. You felt something inside of you, and it confused you. It felt like it was just emotion. You, you felt like maybe you were just moved by the moment, but what you need to understand is that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You felt the power of the Holy Spirit who was promised to come and bring us hope. I, I had a pretty good life before. I, I was saved. I, I, you know, I had a marginal amount of success, but man, the moment I received Jesus, something shifted, something changed, and I want that for you today. So maybe you're here today and you say, uh, Sean, I came here today and I, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I, I've not committed my life to him. I've not surrendered my life to him. Salvation is a uh, it, it's an interesting process. It's a word that we use, a word that we know, but it literally is. like you, Some of you need to be saved today, saved from yourselves, saved from your habits, saved from the words that you say and the actions, saved from the websites. And so today I'm going to give you opportunity to do that. You say, how am I saved? You receive Jesus as your hope. You subscribe to the fact that everything that you're doing wrong can be forgiven. It can be changed. It can be left in this room today and you can begin again. You say, well, how do you do that? Well, the Bible says that you have to do two things to be saved. You, you have to confess and you have to profess. You have to confess that you are a sinner. Being a sinner just means that you're wrong. You have to admit that your life is wrong, but you want to make it right. So you profess that Jesus can change you. So if you're here today and your life is wrong, but you believe that Jesus can change that, we're going to give you an opportunity to receive him as your Lord and Savior. And, and here's how we're going to do that. In just a moment with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm, I'm going to ask for people to do two things. First is in just a moment, I'm going to ask for people who say, Sean, I want to receive Jesus to raise their hand and make eye contact with me. Once you made eye contact with me, you can put your hand down. That's your act of confession, admitting that you, you are a sinner, that your life is wrong. Secondly, I'm going to ask everyone in this room to repeat a prayer after me. And if you repeat the prayer and you mean it in your heart, the Bible says that you will be saved. And so if you're here today and you say, Sean, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, but I would like to, before I leave this place with nobody looking around, would you raise your hand and make eye contact with me today? Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Did I miss anybody? Thanks. Going once, going twice. Okay, I'm going to ask everybody in here to repeat these words after me. Say, Jesus, I've got sin in my life, but I don't want it anymore. Please take it. Please forgive it. Please change me. Make me different. Make me new. Be my Lord and be my Savior in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you guys give a hand to everybody who made that decision today? Come on, man. That's why we're here. We're not... <laughs> If you're online or at one of our other gatherings and you made that decision, would you please reach out to us and let us know that you did that. It is the greatest decision that you'll ever make in your life. If you did that and you're here in this building, you can either take the card that's in the seat back in front of you that says hello across the top, tear off the bottom portion, and fill in whatever information you're okay with us having. Check the box that's highlighted in yellow. It says I'm choosing to follow Jesus. And you could put it in the black buckets when they come around here in just a minute. Or... If you're not comfortable with that, you can scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you or this ginormous QR code that is on the screen and we'll give you the opportunity to connect with us. I'm so excited for 
the journey that you are about to begin. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes one more time before we receive the Lord's tithes and your offering. I wonder if you're here. It's Easter Sunday. Maybe you haven't been here in a minute. And you say, Sean, I'm saved. I'm a Jesus guy or I'm a Jesus girl. But you'd be honest and, and you'd say, Sean, I've been giving in to some temptation. Now, I don't know what that temptation is and I actually don't need to know. But I sure would like to pray for you. So if you're here and you say, Sean, I've, I've been giving into some temptations and I just would love for you to pray for me to have strength. Would you just raise your hand with nobody looking around? Yeah. Jesus, for so many people in this room, God, give them strength, give them mercy, give them peace, give them hope. God, I pray right now that you'll give them the endurance to come against the temptation, to resist in Jesus. You said resist the devil and he will flee in Jesus' name. Amen.